The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, is now recognized. You have to unmute, Mr. Davis. We can't hear you. What about now? Now we can hear you. All right. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of the witnesses who have been with us all afternoon. In the joint bipartisan report released by the Senate last week, the committee found that, and I quote, according to DOD, the Department of Justice was designated as the lead federal agency in charge of security preparations and response on January 6th. However, when he testified before our committee, former acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen seemed to dispute that the Justice Department had been tapped as the lead federal agency. Uh, Lieutenant General Pyatt, was it your understanding prior to January 6th that the Department of Justice had been designated as the lead federal agency? Congressman, it, it is. We had asked for a lead federal agency. I'm not sure exactly when it was designated, but we did not have an integrated security plan. Thank you. General Flynn, same question for you. Congressman, my understanding is exactly as uh, General Pyatt outlined. Thank you. According to documents obtained by our committee, the Army initially recommended against supporting Mayor Bowser's request for National Guard support prior to January 6th in part because the lead federal agency had not been designated at the time. That recommendation changed once DOJ was designated as the lead agency. Lieutenant General Pyatt, could you briefly explain the importance of designating a lead federal agency for large-scale events like January 6th? Yes, Congressman. That, that was a recommendation made to the Acting Secretary of Defense by Secretary McCarthy. That we have a lead federal agency, that federal agencies exhaust all their assets before we support with military support. Um, we supported that recommendation, and that was a way he would, was able to approve Mayor Bowser's request for National Guard forces. Why did DOD then resist granting Mayor Bowser's request? until a lead agency had been identified. We recommended that for, for a better security plan to have a lead federal agency and an integrated security plan. So we would have unity of command and unity of effort so that as anything went on according to plan and in, in event, and events normally do, uh, that lead federal agency would have the authorities required for re requesting additional support. Thank you. Unfortunately, as indicated by Mr. Rosen's testimony before our committee last month, DOJ was either unaware of or resisted its lead agency role. According to the Joint Senate report, Army Chief of Staff General McConville noted, and I'm quoting, DOJ did not conduct any interagency rehearsals or have an integrated security plan as DOJ did during the summer 2020 protests when it had not been designated as the lead federal agency. According to the Senate report, General McConville, and I quote, stressed the importance of integrated security plans and acknowledged that had there been one on January 6th, DOD's response time would have been quicker. General Flynn, had DOJ played a more proactive role in coordinating the federal security preparations prior to January 6th, do you think the federal response would have been quicker? 
Congressman, I can't answer for the Department of Justice. However, what I would say is that that integrated security plan pre-federalized um, soldiers and airmen, uh, a rehearsal and an integrated security plan would have assisted us uh, when the crisis uh, rapidly escalated and the violence went in a direction that uh, was unforecasted. Thank you very much. Well, the documents released by the committee offer one reason senior leadership at the Department of Justice was distracted in the days leading up to January 6th. They seem to be in full-blown crisis mode trying to ward off, off a desperate president from pressuring them to take action to stop the vote. And while they may have succeeded in doing so at DOJ, the results that followed on January 6th were deadly. And Madam Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat-out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are. When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that, and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, that, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. 
Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings in cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people. Right, and so a lot of this uh, the southern, the relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out, and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they they have proven themselves to be uh, you know not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy? Is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.